um, yeah, big chapter. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know if we can get through or if I can get through all my slides today, but I also like packed in a lot. Uh, so let me know if you want to like skip <laughs> any of the slides, because at least for me, like they were all pretty new information. And um, we can also take two weeks if we need to um, without it being a big deal or anything. All right. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. Uh, where's the record button? Oh. Yes, please. Please request recording permission from the meeting host. Oh, uh, none of us are the meeting host. OK, yes. new plan. I'm going to make another Zoom room with my account and I'll send it in the Slack channel. Does that work for everyone? Right. Yeah. Uh, there's an That's... option when you click more that says claim host role. Oh. oh, there you go. But I think it's already recording. Or oh, if you see in the top corner, left. Top, top left corner says recording, <laughs> oh. so. It's been oh, a long that... week. <laughs> that means Wait. it's already recording, right? It yeah. is. Yeah, I think uh, John will trim the video. Uh, he usually cuts before the actual presentation. Oh, is it like automatically recording? Yeah, is yeah, that... yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. okay. I don't remember yeah. pressing anything last week and we got the recording, so. If not, you blame me. Say, Roberto <laughs> said that it was being recorded. We do it again. We do the whole yeah. meeting again. It, it's fine with me. <laughs> well, yeah, should we get started? Okay. Um, yeah, this is me. I am June. Um, I'm new to Twitter, so I'm looking for connections. So I also put my handle. Is that how you call it? ID? Okay. Heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna skip straight forward to 6.2 because I don't actually remember what 6.1 was, but it wasn't like super important. Um, so function fundamentals. Um, for one, I think there's like two important parts when it comes to the fundamentals. So one is that functions can be broken down into three components, argument, body, and environment. And I'm gonna go into detail what they are in the next preceding slides or following slides. Um, but the other thing that's important is that functions are objects and what I take this to mean is that you can save them to names. Um, you can assign them to names. So you can use the assignment operator um, and save a function to a variable like you can with any other value. Um, and you know, once you have done that, you can do stuff with it, like print it in the console. Uh, you can save them into a list, pass them as arguments to other functions, stuff like that, um, that you can usually do with other objects. Um, in terms of the components, we have, again, our arguments or I think formals, body and environment. Um, so first formals are another words for arguments. Um, they're a list of arguments that the function takes. Um, so if you call the function formals to the function miles to kilometers that I just created, um, you get you know, a list. So this is like a named list and you have one element and it's miles. Um, if you look into the structure of this, it says a list um, and that like confirms that it's a list of arguments. I'm not really sure what this dotted pair thing means, means, but I think it just means it's a pair of this argument name and like the fact that it's a symbol or like it's expecting a symbol. Um, not exactly sure. Anyone have thoughts on this? <laughs> or this might be something that the book returns to. Because um, I think this is maybe related to like promises where you're um, declaring something but not defining it. Um, but we can like table that for now. Um, so other than form formals, which are arguments, we also have the body. So body is the actual code inside the function. So it's like the function's definition. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, and the environment is the data structure that tells the function how and where to look for the values associated with the names um, that are used in the body, or I think it's also the argument too. Um, and this is like not super informative. And I think we're gonna get into this more in the environment chapter. <laughs> um, but I think this just means that if you have like a name that's like global, so like outside the function and you call it inside the function, it's able to find it because it like points to the global environment, but maybe wrong, <laughs> we'll, we'll see next chapter. Uh, and then there's also an important or like interesting note about comments, um, which is that, uh, you know, when I first defined a function, I added a comment here. When I called body, the comment is absent. Um, for me to retrieve the comment, I have to call um, 
so I have to access the source ref or a source reference attribute of the function. And that contains um, the actual, I guess, like text of the function as it was written. Um, and then I have like a question here, like what about functions that are like imported or like from packages that are installed? Um, so for example, here's a function called precision from the scales library. Um, and this is, you know, the triple dots notation. It's like an internal function um, that's not available unless you explicitly call it. Um, and so what would happen to like this comment here that's from like the GitHub page, like can we access this comment from this package after we load it? Um, and the answer seems to be no. <laughs> um, so body as expected doesn't show the comment and then attribute is just like null. Um, and that maybe probably has to do with the fact that attributes are kind of like fragile. Um, and like, I think you almost always lose an object's attribute if you pass it through a function, um, as I understand it. Yeah, um, but maybe we'll talk about attributes sometime later too. Um, so that was like the components. Um, there are also functions that are called primitive functions um, and they're relevant here because they don't have those like formals, body um, and environment or whatever that all these other normal functions have. Um, these primitive functions call C code directly um, and they're only found in the base package. Um, and they're of either uh, type built in or special, um, which is not defined <laughs> in the book. Um, and at least from my personal expl exploration of what they are, I don't have like a good sense of what is a built-in or what is a special. Um, so maybe you might have a comment after this slide and the next slide when I like actually show you um, what those functions are. Um, so here's like a, you know, a couple of functions from the base package. You see like, you know, the minus operator, the not operator, like the assignment to a data frame. So some like familiar stuff. Um, and I just wrote like a quick function that loops over or like maps over all these functions and tries to get their type. Um, so here are the functions that are of type built in. Um, so that's mostly like logical operators. Um, I think like, you know, things that test the type of other objects uh, that conversions between different types. Um, and then here's like functions that are of special types. So I think these consist of like indices, accessing and assigning things. Um, I don't know why this is here because this is a logical operator and it's like separated from all these other logical operators. Um, <laughs> and then some other stuff like break, call, if, for, uh, return, stuff like that. Um, so I like kind of have a rough sense of what these two are like what differentiates special from built in, uh, but it's not specified anywhere in the book. And I'm not sure if that's like super relevant, but yeah, just a thought. Um, so again, primitive functions exist in C, like they're written in C, so you can't access like, you know, there's no like formal body um, or like the environment, whatever. If you just print it to the console, it just shows you this. Um, and all you can, get out of it is like, what is the type of the function? And I think that's about as much as you, information as you can get about built-in or primitive functions in R. Um, and then it's the same case with special. So both of these kind of lack these components um, or like they're not defined the same way that uh, native R code is. Um, there's a section on first class functions. So first class functions, I think is not like a definition for like a type of function, but kind of like a property of a language. So R is a language that has first class functions or like where its functions are first class. Um, and so what that means is that functions are objects as we just talked about earlier, um, and it can bind to a name with the assignment operator. So again, we have a function that just adds one, um, we can bind that to a name add one. Um, but we also don't need to, you're probably familiar with anonymous functions. So here in L apply, I pass in a function that's not bound to a variable, um, but like that just works fine. We apply this function to elements of this vector and then we get back a new vector. Um, and then with per, if you, people probably <laughs> are also familiar with the tidyverse, so you can have map, which is like kind of the L apply or other apply family equivalents. Um, 
in the Taiyiverse. Um, and you can also have her own kind of anonymous function, which is like this tilde. Uh, if you have one um, argument, dot x, and then do whatever you want with it. Um, and this is probably also many of you are familiar with. Um, I actually was kind of interested in what this does specifically. So I looked into this. Apparently, inside um, like perf functions, like map functions, um, this function called as mapper is called to the formula that you pass through. So as mapper just takes this um, shorthand that's used in per um, and turns that into a function. So you can just, you know, you can take this formula, wrap it in as mapper, assign it to a variable, and you can call it like you would any other function. Um, so we got add one version two, pass it a vector one, two, get back two, three. Um, and you can also still use it anonymously. So you can do as mapper and then call the argument. Um, and that also like works fine, which is like kind of cool. I don't know if I'll ever use this, but um, it was interesting to see how it works in um, per. Um, okay, invoking functions. Um, if arguments are stored in a list, then you can do do that call to call a function with those arguments. Um, so here I have this variable args. Um, it's a list of one to 10 and na.rm equals true. Um, and then if you use the do.call function, pass in a function as a first argument, the name the list of arguments as the second argument, then you get back what's effectively mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, <laughs> um, and na.rm equals true. Um, and the function that's passed through the first argument of do.call can also be uncoded, which I didn't know until like very recently. Um, and I think I found this really useful for um, working with uncoded variables in like the tidy framework. Um, I think it like integrates really well. I didn't know you could do this, um, but apparently you can. Um, another thing that I was kind of curious about when I was reading this section is that if you look at the first element of the arguments list, this one isn't named. Um, so like how is do dot call, how is do dot call able to say that, oh, this is the argument for the, for um, I think it's named X, which is the name of the argument that mean takes that it takes a mean over. Um, so I was like, how do you, how can you assign that? Um, and I thought like maybe it's because this is the first element of the list and because the first argument of mean is a numeric vector. So it just like kind of automatically associates these two. So like this is not named, but I'm going to take this as the argument that I'm going to take the mean over. Um, turns out not. <laughs> um, so if I flip the order and do make an argument list like this, so the first list uh, or the first, first element of the list of arguments is any.rm equals true. The second one still unnamed is just a vector one through 10 and it's fine. Like it can parse it. It can evaluate this to mean take the mean of one through 10 um, and then remove the NA values. Um, but then like, at least obviously, like if I add more unnamed arguments, it's gonna break. Um, so it looks like one of these unnamed arguments um, are spilling over into the dot, dot, dot inside mean. And I think the first one happens to be trim. Um, and then it doesn't like it because trim has to be of length one. I don't know if you can see the last part, but yeah, I don't know, that was kind of cool. But this feels like it shouldn't work, but it does. <laughs> Um, so that was kind of interesting to find. Uh, there's exercises. I don't know if we should do them like as we go along or um, maybe we can like return to them at the end. I don't know, thoughts? <laughs> Let me just recheck what they are. Uh, right, so we got, yeah. This might make us want to go back. How about, I don't know, should I should I just do the slides and then if I like run out of time or like if you want to continue it, we can move the exercises to like next meeting or something? Yeah, sure. What do y'all feel? Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, all right, mm -hmm. let me, where did my slides go? There it is. All right, yeah, we can return to this. I don't think, it really matters for the other sections that we completely understand this part. Um, the next section is function composition. 
So there's two ways to compose function calls in base R. Um, so you can nest them. So you can, you know, you just have like square root inside of the square root function. You have the mean function, which takes a vector of one to a hundred as an argument. Um, and that evaluates, or that's like composition of the two functions. Um, or you can save and pass along intermediate variables. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Um, and you, but then you can also use pipes. Um, so you can do like one through 100, take the mean of it, and then take the square root. Um, and at least what Hadley says here is that it's good because it allows you to focus on what's being done. So like the functions or the verbs, as opposed to what's being modified, which are the objects or the nouns. Um, and I think this is like pretty useful for at least like functional programming when you have to like pass a lot of stuff through functions, um, you can kind of shorthand this and it removes um, a lot of like mental labor, cognitive labor <laughs> um, to have to keep track of the exact variable that's being passed through, uh, which I think is nice. Um, I put like this link to the style guide here because um, apparently if you're like a hardcore like tidyverse person, you should always put parentheses um, because it works even without them, but apparently it's to make it extra clear that you're passing things through a function. Um, yeah. Oh, that was it. Lexical scoping. <laughs> um, so lexical scoping um, is about um, looking up values of names based on how is, I think it defines the property of functions looking up the values of names based on how it is defined, not how it is called. Um, I'm going to try to explain this well, but this kind of caught me um, a bit. So here we have a variable that's defined outside the function. So x is assigned 10. Inside of this function, x is assigned another value, and then it calls x. Um, and when you call the entire function, what's returned is the value of x that is defined inside the functions, not outside. And I think that's what it means by looks at the values based on how a function is defined. Like this is how the function is defined. So if you're looking for the value of x, you look inside it. Um, and I think you look outside when you know you have to, and it's not in there. Um, and this lexical scoping rule follows four primary like other rules in R, um, which is name masking, functions versus variables, fresh start, and dynamic lookup. So what name masking means is that names defined inside a function masks the names defined outside the function, which is exactly what we saw. Um, and if a name isn't defined inside a function, then R looks one level up or one environment up. So we have the global environment and then we have the function environment. In the global environment, we have X saved to two. Um, the value of Y is one inside. When you go to evaluate um, concatenate X, Y inside the function, um, you don't find X, find X inside the function environment. So you look one level up into the global environment, uh, fetch this value. Um, and then you go to look at y, y is defined inside the function, so it's fine. And then it returns one, two. Um, yeah, this was like an exercise question. <laughs> People want to take a stab at this? Um, so that one returns one, two, three. Yeah, I think Just that's like right. looks up the call stack. <laughs> X yeah. is defined outside, Y is defined in the middle, Z is defined in the innermost function. So X, Y, Z goes with the look, then goes up to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it too. Like you start from the call or the expression, and then you, when you evaluate it, you kind of mentally think about how it like moves up um, the environment to look for it. So like you start here find Z, doesn't find X and Y, move up, find Y, still haven't found X, move up again, find X. Can I actually uh, ask a oh, question? Yeah. So yeah. I, for me, it was new to see someone writing a function within a function. Um, has anyone done this within their own practice? Because I have a hard time thinking of examples when that's useful. I personally haven't. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I don't, typically write it as a function, but I'll use anonymous functions, like like demonstrated with the as mapper or rlang as function. Um, sometimes put a, if I'm going to use an anonymous function multiple times, 
um, and I'm defining it in a package, um, I'll put it in the function. Um, but that's only if it's an anonymous function. And I honestly don't know how much it adds to the overhead to like parse the function inside the function rather than defining it outside of the function. So it's pre-parsed and then it just runs inside the function. Um, so that's something I'm not sure about. My guess would be like, it's probably faster if it's defined outside the function and it's just looked up rather than like parsed inside the function and run inside the function. So, yeah. Yeah. I can also imagine that being maybe kind of costly if you like run this function multiple times and you're like assigning a function every time you call the function that wraps it. Um, so yeah, I also don't really see this a lot in practice, uh, probably for a good reason. Um, functions versus variables. Uh, oh yeah, so just like we saw with objects um, or like variables that hold values, um, functions are also objects again. So scoping rules also apply to functions. So this is like the same case. We have this function um, or like this name being assigned a function twice. Uh, the one that's defined inside is what's called by the function. Um, so you add 100 to x um, and 10 is passed through as x. So what gets returned is 110, not 11. Um, and when this was new for me, um, when a function and a non function share the same name and that name is called as a function, then R ignores the non function. So in this syntax, this G09 is you know, followed by uh, parentheses that wraps an element. Um, so this is being parsed as a function. So R is not going to replace this with this value. It's going to look up until it finds a function and then call that um, as like a function because this syntax says tells R that this is a function. So it's not going to try to define it as a variable, or it's not going to look for a value that's not a function. Uh, but then inside here, like nothing tells R that this has to be a function. So you just grab um, this value. So it's this function um, where the value of X is 10. So it's again, 110. Um, obviously, Hadley mentions in the book, this is bad practice. <laughs> um, so don't do it. Um, the third property of scoping is a fresh start. So every time a function is called, a new environment is created to host this execution. Um, so this is a function that assigns some value to A and then returns that value. Um, and no matter how many times you call it, this is the uh, output of this function is one um, because it never creates the, the variable A in the global environment. You're always kind of doing that work internally. Um, and then afterwards, it's just like gone. <laughs> um, yeah. There is a way to, to preserve that variable. If you do the uh, double less than yeah. sign and the dash, then you could assign A to the global environment. Yeah, so, I was actually hoping that the book would talk about the double arrow assignment, and it doesn't. Because <laughs> um, all I've heard about it is just like, don't use it. <laughs> And if you use it, then CRAN will reject your package, apparently. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why I mentioned this, because I, I submitted a package to CRAN, to CRAN, and it was for a progress bar. So they were doing, saving the, like, the tick in which step you were in the global variable. And then they sent me an email saying, you can't do that. Remove it. And so I had to remove it. Anyone have thoughts about that? Like, why does that happen? like guesses <laughs> um it will it will actually save the variable if a variable is not declared it'll save it to the global environment but if it is declared it will save it to wherever the variable is declared so it could go and overwrite a variable in any of the environments with the same name so i it's kind of like a wild card assignment Thing. And I think that is probably why, because uh, when you're overriding just up the call stack somewhere, you could be overriding a variable inside of a function 
that is above it that causes an error downstream. I think that's why. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, kind of would have liked to have a section on this though <laughs> in the book, uh, but maybe that's something for us to explore individually. <laughs> Um, the last property of lexical scoping is dynamic lookup. Um, so um, here, we kind of also went over this, but output of a function can depend on objects outside the function environment. So this usually happens when you have a name inside a function that's not internally defined. Um, and so R has to kind of go up um, uh, an environment to fetch it. So in this case, if you assign the variable in the global environment to different values, then the function what the function returns will be different depending on how that variable is defined. Um, and that's like, has nothing to do with the function definition itself, just like the state of the global environment can um, force that behavior, uh, which I think is people are probably familiar with. <laughs> um, this was like interesting. Um, apparently you can prevent R from looking for values outside the function. Um, if you set the function environment to an empty environment, so you're switching from the environment of the function being the global environment to you assign an empty environment to the environment of the function. Now it's an empty environment. Um, and then when you call this function, it can't search for X, which is in the global environment. Um, not entirely sure where it will be useful. I think there was a note that this isn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is like a, I guess this is a way of kind of, yeah, constraining um, R's search for um, names so that it doesn't go into the global environment. Yeah, I don't know if there's like an, any use case for this, but yeah. All right, lazy eval. Um, this is something that like I heard a lot about, but like I only had like an approximate idea of uh, I feel like it's talked about everywhere, but like I didn't really know what it was until I read the chapter. Um, basically, lazy evaluation means that in R, function arguments are only evaluated if they are accessed. So it's lazy because it's not evaluated until you like really need to evaluate it. Um, so if you have a function that takes an argument x, but it just returns 10, um, then no matter what you um, throw in as the value of x, um, it's just going to return 10. Um, even if you call a uh, stop, which is supposed to like stop the function or like break the function, um, doesn't do that. It just like skips evaluation of X because it's not called inside the function, just returns 10. Um, this works because of uh, this thing called promises, um, also called a thunk. Um, a promise is a data structure um, and it's a data structure that powers this lazy evaluation thing. Um, it has three components. It has an expression, that gives rise to the delayed computation. So here like X, um, it has an environment where the expression should be evaluated. So I think this means that it's probably the function. Um, and then a value that is evaluated at most once in the specified environment. Uh, let me see if I ever cleared this up. <laughs> um, so you have a function here uh, that takes X, sends a message, says calculating, uh, multiplied by two and returns it. Um, and you have another function here. Oh yeah, I do clarify. Okay, <laughs> you have another function here that takes, um, I think, yeah, takes an argument and then just like duplicates it, puts it in a vector. Um, if it, if this function receives an argument that is this function, um, presumably you have to put the value of whatever this is into both of these slots, uh, but it looks like it's only being evaluated once, which is why you only see this message once, even though the values are both here. So I think when you get to this function, um, you evaluate what X is first, and then you kind of like slot them in into appropriate areas. Um, or like you get here, you realize you have to know what the value of X is, call it once, and then now it's available. Um, so you don't get this message twice. Um, Default arguments, apparently you can do like really crazy things with it. Um, so inside this function, the arguments aren't just like um, constants. They're also, you know, like interacting with other arguments. 
Um, here we have like x times 2 as the value for y, a plus b as the value for z, um, but none of these are actually going to be evaluated until you get to this call, um, which says that, well, now I need the values x, y, and z. Um, so what you can actually do is create a function like this, call this function, it's going to assign a to 10, b to 100, and then when you go to evaluate what x, y, and z should be, you go into these functions and you have these values available. Um, even though at this point, a and b aren't defined, at this point it is. And this is the point when you call or evaluate z. Um, so it works fine. Uh, and then I tried this thing out. If you um, switch the order so that this call is before b is defined, then it can't define z because b is not found. Um, so if you try to call this, it will error. Um, and again, what I did here was I moved B after this. Um, yeah, so it looks like it really follows a strict order. Um, and then as we saw, default arguments are evaluated inside the function, um, but then user supplied arguments are evaluated in the global environment. So if you pass um, LS to um, in the formals, um, it is evaluated inside, is that right? Oh, yeah. Um, so this here um, is defining x within the function. So ls is going to be evaluated with respect to the function environment. And in this function, there's variables x and a and x. If you explicitly supply it, then this is going to get evaluated before being passed in. Um, and so x is this because this is a function that's defined in the global environment. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, missing arguments. You can use uh, this function missing to determine if an argument is user supplied. Um, this really tripped me up because I remember seeing missing before, but I never like really understood what it did. Um, apparently, it's not that missing tests whether a value of something is missing. Um, it just tests whether that's been user supplied. So here we have a value of x, x is 10. Um, but if we ask if x is missing, it will return true because x is not user supplied. And if, even though it has a value, it's considered like missing. Um, and if you actually want to test for whether a value is missing or like a value doesn't exist, then you use the exist function instead. So if you were to call like exist y here, for instance, it would return like false. Um, but missing is something different. I didn't know um, there was a difference between missing and exist or what exactly missing did. But this tests whether something was user supplied. Um, I think, yeah, it's not encouraged though. Um, I'm not really sure, but the alternative is that you use null instead. So you just like initialize, I guess, um, the arguments that you want to leave as optional um, or the arguments you want to have default values without having a value supplied by the user. Um, just set that to null inside the formals, and then in the form in the body of the function, just check if it is null. Um, if so, then just do like a thing by default. If not, do some other thing according to the user input. Um, again, not sure why we should use null instead of missing. Uh, anyone have thoughts on that? <laughs> so is. Is using null um, in this way preferred to using exists in place of missing? Um, I'm not, I, I'm actually not sure if you just, so if you have like X here, it's not defined anything, defined mm -hmm. as anything. If you call exist X inside of the function body, I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm going to check that out really quickly. Oh, it like errors. <laughs> um, yeah. Good to know. Oh, wait, I have to, I think I have to pass, oh, the argument that's passed to exist has to be quoted. That makes sense. Okay, yeah, it, that returns true. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I guess just checking it with the function is discouraged. You just want to have 
these arguments as null by default. Yeah. I think maybe the reason is is because if you set them as null, like you can act on null and it behaves like a thing that has properties. Whereas like if it's just missing, as soon as you call it, it's going to throw an error saying it's not there. Um, and then there's also that little Arlang infix operator with the like double bars inside of the per percentage, which allows you to kind of like pipe replace null values with other values in a really simple format. I think it demoed that. Yeah, maybe this just like opens yourself up to more coherent workflows. Yeah, looking at the back of the book, it says if you don't supply null, then it looks like you have to supply x and size, but you don't. You only have to supply x. Like if you look at the help page for sample, because there's not a default value. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, but then like the thing is like, why isn't the function written so that you just yeah. check for a missing inside? But I think that like it's, speaks to the fact that no one wants to use it. <laughs> I don't know. Did you have something you wanted to add? No. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I have no idea why it, it's discouraged, but I don't have a problem with it. I already used this. I didn't even know what missing was. <laughs> Um, and again, like something like this is works. So you could actually have just said, like, instead of checking for a condition, just like, you know, this is saying like, if the user doesn't supply anything, then assign value of size to length X and then evaluate it. Um, but then you could, um, just do it <laughs> inside the arguments. Um, so you could, this would also mean by default. Um, whatever is supplied as a value of x, take the length of it, assign it to size, and then evaluate this call. This also works, um, but it's also discouraged. <laughs> uh, is that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Is that one discouraged because it's going to evaluate length x in the global? So, like, if you have x in the oh. top level environment, it's, it's probably going to evaluate it there, isn't it? I think so, it... I think if it's in the formals, it gets evaluated with respect to the function environment. Because in the LS yeah, example, right. yeah, because this here was, you know, assigned inside of the formals and it returns the variables that are inside the function, not the global environment. I'm not sure I why, this why is. that's the convention, because it seems like, like when you're doing, if you're working in our studio, the prompter is going to show you that like the default is going to be length x there when you're typing it out whereas if it just says no but it actually replaces it inside of that you're less likely to know when you first run that function yeah i guess maybe that's just to force folks to use like documentation <laughs> so yeah. so you don't so you might see the default value is null but then you have like a you're supposed to write a whole paragraph explaining what it's supposed to do um, when you don't supply anything, even though the value itself is null, probably does something else. I don't know, but I'm like personally fine with not using either of these or not using missing and this. Uh, dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot allows functions to take any number of additional arguments. I think you're probably familiar with like uh, list also like filter in dplyr. Um, basically, if you just like wrap, um, if you pass dot, 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 and then just like wrap it in a list, for example, then it'll evaluate the arguments and then store them. So if you um, passed in a equals one, b equals two, um, formals are you know, effectively lists. You capture it and then it returns you a named list where a is you know, one, b is two. Um, there's two primary uses of this. One is to pass additional arguments to a function that itself is then also passed a function. Let me see if I can explain this. <laughs> okay, so we got x. Um, it's a list of two numeric vectors. Um, and then here we're um, using this list of two numeric vectors. 
where uh, L apply, we're applying the mean of it. And then this is like the, where the dot, dot, dot of L apply is, um, this dot, dot, dot gets passed into, um, uh, gets passed as an argument of mean, even though it's like outside of mean. Um, and that's how L apply uses dot, dot, dot. So this works the same as, um, oh, this is just like a per way of saying it. I think they have another example. Yeah, so this is, this is the same as this. Um, if you were to make a function that has na dot n equals true, um, and then pass x to this like by default remove na values mean function. Uh, so these are the same. I don't know, actually like, I wanna know like which one you all use more often because I use this one more often this way. Um, but I don't know if any of you use this way more often. I don't know, thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think the, oh yeah. Um, I tend to use per because of the anonymous Lambda syntax, because in our studio you can hit control up or down and it'll go to the next function definition. And that's really useful if you're in like an R script that has multiple functions in it. You can just go to the next function and change it. So if you're like writing supporting functions for a larger major function below it, um, you can use control up, control down to toggle between them. But if you have a lot of little Lambda functions or not Lambda functions, but functions declared like that, when you control up, it's gonna move the cursor to each one of those sub functions. And that used to bug me. So <laughs> I stopped using oh. L apply and um, just started using the map functions in per because you can use the little lambda and the control up and down syntax doesn't land on it but that's just kind of like a a little efficiency thing yeah i didn't know that that's yeah i'm totally gonna adopt that into my workflow um but yeah i also don't really use l apply um and i don't really like to pass arguments separately I think this like looks nicer. I don't know. Um, there's something else with like dot 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 and S3 generics, but I'm gonna leave that aside for like chapter like 20 or whatever, <laughs> whenever we start talking about object oriented programming. Um, there's some other use cases of dot 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 that I personally used and feel free to like chime in with yours. Um, one time or like actually like very recently, um, I used dot 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 to pass it as the second argument of do dot call. Um, so if I want to run simulation, if I want like a simul, if I want a function that runs simulation on a bunch of models, but th these different models have different parameters as arguments, then I might just say like, okay, this is a function that takes a model and then takes whatever arguments that particular model takes, and then this function is going to wrap those arguments into a list and then pass it into do dot call, um, and yeah, this was useful. Notice that this is unquoted because I can. Um, and this was very efficient for my like unquoted tidy workflow. Um, and I got stuck actually when I was first trying to figure this out because you can't do this apparently. Um, because the second argument of do.call has to be a list. Um, do.call doesn't, is not taking arguments in the dot dot dot. It just takes a list as a second argument. So you have to wrap it um, in params first. Um, I think that's like the one and only use of dot 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 I've had is <laughs> just like using it in do dot call after wrapping it into a list. Um, there's also some like example of using it in ggplot too that I just linked here, um, but it's like kind of the same concept. Um, I don't know when have you all used? Do you all use this a lot? The dot dot dot, or like ever? I have been using. I love the cat. <laughs> I have been using the dot 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 notation uh, to inherit uh, parameters for a denoir function. So I have a function which it does some pre-processing and then it will call an, an external function from a different uh, package. So I usually just do my like pre-processing function 
and then I pass dot 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 as last parameter, mm -hmm. and then internally I do some some calculations or whatever, and then I call that other function from the external package. And recently I found that uh, using Roxygen, you can do inherit dot params. So it will document those external parameters. And oh. it's amazing. So yeah, like you don't have convenient. It is because then you can use whoever wrote the pa that package documentations in, in yours. So <laughs> you just like steal their documentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, well, I noticed great. something though. Uh, I was working in a package and then I did the DevTools spell check. Mm -hmm. And then it gave me some typos. I was like, hmm, I'm sure I looked for those before. And then I found it was, they were coming from the inherit.params. I was like, damn it, they did something wrong. <laughs> so I said, like, okay, that's fine. It was like just a few words that they skipped a uh, few characters. I was like, okay. But yeah, it's a very handy thing. Yeah, I've never used this in a context of a package, but I, yeah, I can see that being super useful. Uh, another example is I was working in a wrapper for um, SQL queries. So if you have select, then I say, well, I have a function called select, but I want them, the user to pass like different strings. So select from this, this, whatever. But instead of having them to paste everything, like to paste zero, whatever, then I allow them with the dot dot notation to pass small chunks of the whole query. And then internally, I will just do list dot 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 and then paste everything. And so it kind of helps the users. So, yeah, no, that's cool. Mm. Mm, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> I'm didn't know that. Uh, yeah, good stuff. All right, exiting a function. Um, so there's sure. two ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention one last thing about the dots. Um, there's an Arlang dots list, which is a little less prone to error than just going list dot dot dot. Um, mm -hmm. I think it like it like removes null values and like they don't have to all be named or something. Um, it's like slightly more flexible. And so I just wanted to mention that. Cool. Yeah, I'm just looking at the documentation. It also deals with like homonyms if you name the same argument twice, empty arguments. Yeah, that's great. Um, I don't use this a lot, but I'm actually gonna try to you know, I haven't developed a habit for using list dot dot dot, so I'm just gonna switch over to Arlang then. <laughs> All right, um, this is, again, super, you know, probably already familiar with this. You can return a function by just, you know, whatever is the last thing to be evaluated inside the function um, is gonna be returned, or you can explicitly return something with the return function, I guess. Um, and then apparently like where you place return can affect control flow. Like if you place it inside, if um, it might escape the, or like if you have like a loop and you have like control flow, like if else statements and you put return inside um, one of those statements, it might like exit or break at the wrong place. Um, so I think the style guide again has some like tips for when not and when to use return. Um, Invisible values. So usually, um, if you just like have a value um, at the end of a function or like a name, then it's evaluated. It returns it, prints it, um, but you can suppress it by wrapping it in this invisible function, um, and then like nothing's printed. Um, and then you can then print invisible returns with with visible function, which will return you the function and just like kind of force it um, to explicitly print. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen this being used, but this is used a lot in like plotting things, obviously. Um, errors, um, I don't use errors a lot. And I think reading this section helped me understand why I don't use like stop and other stuff a lot. It's because I write things for myself <laughs> without um, care for others who might, you know, use my code and run into trouble. 
Uh, but if you're like a seasoned developer, I guess like errors are pretty crucial because other people will use your stuff and you want to, you know, force them to deal with the problem. Um, but like if I encounter an error, like, you know, like I kind of like know where I'm at. Um, but yeah, uh, you can throw an error with the stop function as we saw earlier. Um, it also doesn't really need a message, but it should probably have one. If it doesn't have a message, it just like prints nothing. Um, I know it could do that, but it, it works, but it doesn't print anything. Um, exit handlers. Uh, so exit handlers um, are ways of kind of um, dealing with functions that make changes to the global environment. Um, again, like this doesn't really happen much in functional programming um, because we're just passing things through functions. We don't like modify in place. Um, but say like, you know, we're um, dealing with, or like we're making modifications to like global options. So here we have a string as factors. It's false. It's true in the book. <laughs> it's true in the book, but you know, R4.0. Um, so it's false uh, by default. We can have a function that causes us as a side effect sets the option to true from the default of false. Um, and then inside this function, I get the value right after I set the option is true. And in the global environment, it's still true. Um, so this like change persists. Um, so if I want to have the option setting be like temporary um, or like local, then I need to have exit handlers to undo the change um, as I'm exiting the function. Um, so the way to do that is with on exit, this on exit function. Um, so here, this is where I set the string as factors to true. And before I exit the function, I call on exit, set this back to false. Um, and then this second argument of on exit, which is add equals true here, um, Hadley says you should always use it. Um, it's good practice. Otherwise, like it will, like subsequent on exits will override previous um, exit handler statements. Uh, but if you add add equals true, um, they're all kind of like combined. Um, so now that we have this exit handler, um, we call the function and then we call, we we retrieve the option the global environment and it's false. It's only true inside the function. Um, I think this is useful. I don't know when I'll use it. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is um, just demonstrating the add argument. So if you do add equals true, um, both of these work. So on exit, we're both printing out the message A and B. Um, if you don't put in add equals true, it the second one overrides the first one and it only prints B. Yeah, good practice always set to true. Uh, I got like three minutes. Um, I don't think I can get through this part. We probably would have to return to it. Um, oh, should I try it? <laughs> it's one section. Should I should I go for it? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll make it. I'll make it quick. Um, this is just like different ways of um, defining um, and calling functions. So there's four different ways of calling a function. Um, you can have prefix functions, so it, the function precedes the arguments. Um, infix functions, like the percent, what's like this thing called? Like the vertical line, vertical line percent <laughs> um, thing that Stefan was talking about. Um, and replacement functions, uh, which replaces values by assignment, and then like special functions, which you can't define as a user, but is in um, built into R. Um, and then all functions in R can be rewritten to prefix form. I feel like this was already went over, but like you can, you know, if you have like x plus y plus is an infix, you can put that outside back ticks and then call the arguments inside parentheses. Um, same with like um, replacement. Uh, so this is saying, this is like a function that assigns um, something. <laughs> um, and then you can, instead of having this assignment operator be infixed, um, you can put that outside to the left. Um, and then even stuff like for loops um, can be written like this, which um, I don't think I'll ever use this, but you, you can do that. Um, and in the prefix form, there's three ways to specify arguments. Um, these two you're probably already familiar with um, by position, by argument name. You can apparently also do partial matching 
um, which I didn't know you could do. Um, I'm really glad that I didn't run into an error that involved this because I wouldn't have been able to debug it. Um, apparently you can partial match. I think it's because formals are lists and you can access lists with partial matching with the dollar sign. Maybe that's why. Um, so if I have like a list um, named list, um, the name is topic, value is mean. If I just put top, it can return the value mean. Um, I think that's what's happening. My like gut feeling. Um, yeah. But yeah, be aware this can happen. Um, infix functions, you can define them, but they always have to begin and end with the percent sign. Um, so this is like a function from the book that's just like um, you add strings together. Um, if you like used Python before, this is actually something that I missed a lot from Python, just like being able to add strings. Um, can't do that in base star, but you can define a function um, that does that. Um, and then order of course matters. Um, so if you have a, if the function takes a and b, but then it pastes in the order of b and a, then it will flip the order. Um, you can apparently define multi-argument infixes, but then you can't really use them in the infix form. So it's kind of useless. So you could define something like this and then call the function. Um, but then like, how would you organize three elements on, into two spots? Um, it's kind of weird, but you can't do that. Uh, replacement functions have to end with this assignment thing in the name. Um, and then it's assignment, so it follows, or like it, it's assignment, but it still follows copy on modify. Um, yeah, does, has anyone ever used this? Like make like a replacement function? Yeah, the only place I've seen it is like data frame and like data table and like tibble. Um, I don't know. This is, yeah, this feels more like a class method to me than something I would use um, for like data science-y things. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you like ever like use replacement functions, you can have multiple arguments um, and they will all just be um, in the left-hand side. Um, so, I think this is saying x goes here, position is to the, oh yeah, position is, oh, I don't know how this actually works. But like, the, the, but like I think the point is that replacement functions, you know, have an assignment arrow in as like an infix in the middle. And then you have two sides where you can put the arguments. If you have more than two arguments, then the extra arguments has to be added to the left-hand side, which is why you have both x and one, so two arguments here, only one argument can go on the right-hand side, which like kind of makes sense. Um, special forms are not super interesting. Um, it's not, the book doesn't talk about them a lot. Um, you know, it's stuff like the parentheses. If you wanna, um, you know, call like, look at the help page for special forms, you have to wrap it in back ticks and then call the question mark. Um, and then all the special forms are primitive functions that we went over, um, which we also noted were not super interesting beyond just being special forms. Um, apparently else is not <laughs> like a function. Um, and if you're actually like, if you actually tried, um, if you use Arlang um, and have tried to um, call help on like the bang bang operator, um, it's also not exactly defined. The only thing that help or like backtick bang bang will return is that like you can't call it on its own. Um, and I think the explanation there was that it's kind of like um, how the plus works in ggplot. Like it doesn't exist outside of um, the context of the function being called. So else doesn't e exist or it doesn't make sense outside of if statements because it's like if else. Um, and so I think that's why if you just backtick else and backtick, it doesn't return, you know, like anything. Um, it just says you can't find else, probably because it only exists insofar as if exists. Yay, <laughs> went through it. Yay. Uh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know, do you all have thoughts about returning to exercises or proceeding or anything? Thank you.
Is anybody signed up for next week or should I do that? It's all you if you want it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me, I'll, I'll send the link in the chat. Okay. So it's convenient. It. Thank you. I can also add your name um, if you would like me to. And the slides, are y'all pulling that from the like cohort one GitHub or something and modifying them or just building I, there is a, from scratch? There is a template uh, in the advanced R repo. So I like copied the template folder, pasted it or like, and then like made a new folder inside week six called cohort four. Um, and then copy paste the contents of that folder inside. And then I just edited um, or like made my slides in that directory. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, good to know. And that, if I just search GitHub for advanced R, I can I probably find it. Yeah, there it is. Link. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it's um, in the same sign up uh, Google Sheets, there is that link and then the general GitHub repo um, for the R for Data Science organization. Hey, stop that. Okay, sweet. Sounds good. I will put it together for next week. Thank you.